Hello students and welcome back to part two of our discussion on virology. This is lecture number 10. In the last lecture we discussed a bunch of general principles about viruses and how vaccines work and how vaccines are the only effective prevention of viruses. Uh, we, we have some treatments of viruses that are meant to meant to help once you once you've already been infected by a virus but uh, it's always much better to prevent getting the virus infection in the first place than it is to try and treat it once you have it. That's always the case. Uh, all right, so now what we'll do in this lecture is we'll discuss a few examples of virus families. So believe it or not, viruses are actually grouped according to families, and this is based partly on the Baltimore classification system for viruses. We learned in the last lecture that there's a famous virologist named David Baltimore who's still at, at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, and he invented a method of, or he developed a method of classifying viruses based on their genome, whether they have a double-stranded DNA genome, a single-stranded DNA genome, or a single-stranded RNA genome, and so on. And based partly on that, um, the phylogenists have grouped together the viruses into families. So viruses don't really have phyla the way we, they don't they're, they don't belong to a phylum the way animals do or plants do, but we do group them together into sort of families where they have similar characteristics, mainly a similar genome, and so on. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to deal with the, we're going to learn some specific examples of the important DNA virus families, and then we'll learn some important examples of the, of the important uh, uh, RNA virus families and the retrovirus families and so on. So the first thing we're going to learn is the important, a few examples of the important DNA viruses, starting with Poxviridae. Right, Poxviridae cause a, a disease called smallpox, which you might have heard of, and we'll talk about that. Especially a, a particular member of the Poxviridae family is called variola virus, which causes smallpox, which has now been officially eradicated. Another family of DNA viruses is called, are called the papillomavirus family. And the, one of the examples we'll learn of that family is the HPV-16. HPV stands for human papillomavirus. This virus has a narrow host range. It only infects humans. It does not have animal reservoirs. And it causes, among other things, it causes cervical cancer in women because women are the only ones who have a cervix. Men don't have a cervix. So therefore, men can carry, men can be infected by HPV-16, but they do not get cervical cancer, but they, they are capable of giving the virus to women that they have sex with, generally. And those women are in danger of having cervical cancer. The good news is there's a, there is a vaccine that can prevent HPV-16 infection. The bad news is there are a lot of people working to make sure that girls never get the vaccine because they think it, they irrationally think that will encourage them to be promiscuous, which is silly in my opinion. But there is a, there is a vaccine against HPV-16 and it's available and my advice is that all, all women should get it. Uh, whether they're planning to be sexually active or not, why not just be safe? Better to be safe than sorry. So the HPV-16 vaccine is available for women and which can potentially prevent you from getting cervical cancer. The next family of DNA viruses we'll study are the herpes viridae, which of course call, cause a disease that's known as herpes. The specific example we'll talk about is the human herpes virus 2, HHV2 causes a disease called herpes genitalis, which is a, a blistering disease of the genitals. It's a sexually transmitted disease. So HPV-16 is a sexually transmitted disease, and so is human herpes virus. And whenever you have sexually transmitted diseases, uh, the simple simple act of public health prevention for public health prevention and, and prevention of spreading of, of the disease takes on moral overtones which kind of co kind of complicate the situation uh, and then we'll learn about the a, a little bit more simpler viruses the hepatinoviridae they are circular double-stranded DNA vi viruses, and there are several uh, viruses that infect the liver that are, that are hepatotropic. 
And in this case, the only one that has the only virus that infects the liver and has a double stranded DNA genome is the HBV virus, stands for, uh, uh, st um, stands for hepatitis B virus, right? Hepatitis B virus. And it causes damage, it causes cirrhosis, inflammation and cirrhosis of the liver. Then we'll move on to the RNA viruses. There's a family of RNA viruses that have a plus stranded RNA genome and they are called the picornaviruses. Now, picornavirus is kind of an interesting family name because it stands for pico. The word pico is Latin for small and then RNA stands for ribo, uh, uh, ribonucleic acid and then viridae stands for family of viruses. So this actually tells you in the name that these viruses are quite small and they have an RNA genome. Okay, so it, it, the name actually tells you the structure of the genome and the size of the virus. Uh, so we will learn a specific example, poliovirus, which causes poliomyelitis, is the example from the Bicornaviridae family that we'll learn. Then we'll learn about the family Rhinoviridae. The, rhin the word rhino means nose. These are the viruses. They have a plus RNA genome and they cause colds, right? They are members of Baltimore group four, right? Then we'll learn about the family Flavoviridae. These have a linear plus stranded RNA genome and the example virus, the exemplar that we will learn is the hepatitis C virus, which causes hepatitis C. Then we'll learn about the Rhabdoviridae family. The Rhabdoviridae family, example, the rabies virus, which is also known as the Lyssa virus, causes rabies. If you, you've heard of being, you, you're being bitten by a mad dog, a, a dog that has rabies, you would get rhabdo, a, a rabies virus or Lyssa virus. Then we'll learn about uh, the family Orthomyxoviridae. So the Orthomyxo contains the word mix and then remember that orthomyxoviridae families have a segmented genome. It happens to be minus strand RNA. But the best known example is influenza. The influenza viruses belong to this family. And the reason why it's important to remember that they have the word mix in their name is because this is, these are the things that with segmented genomes where you can have reassortment of the chromosomes to give you a new mixture of virus, gives you a new strain of virus because the chromosomes reassort if somebody gets co-infected with two different strains of the influenza virus. Then finally, we'll talk about the retroviridae family. The retroviridae family have RNA genomes they bring with them their own special enzyme that is able to make a DNA copy from an RNA template. That's the reverse of what most uh, enzymes of this nature do. The enzymes that we have, for instance, make an RNA copy from a DNA template. These, these viruses have a, an enzyme that they bring with them called reverse transcriptase, which makes a DNA copy from an RNA template. And because that's kind of backwards and reverse of what we normally do, we call that retro. Retro means in reverse. So retro, retroviridae are the most famous example is the AIDS virus. The AIDS syndrome is caused by a virus called the human immunodeficiency virus. And, and that is a Baltimore group six virus. Okay, so you have in, in the notes for this week, you have a couple of tables. One table lists all the viruses that I'm going to talk about by virus type. And the other table lists the viruses by viral tropism, basically by which, which organ system do they infect, which type of tissue do they invade. Okay, let's start with the DNA viruses. Okay, so once again, we're going to learn about the Poxviridae family. Example, the variola virus, which causes smallpox. Then we'll learn about the Papillomaviridae, which cause warts, these ugly lumps of flesh that we call warts, W-A-R-T-S. The best example is the H, one of the, one of the key examples is the HPV-16 virus, which not only causes a sexually transmitted d disease called genital warts, but it also causes, so it causes, gen it causes warts to appear on the genitals, on the reproductive organs of both men and women, but it also causes women to be infected with cervical cancer uh, with a certain degree of, uh, with a certain a degree of certainty. 
Okay, then we'll learn about the herpes viridae family, which causes herpes. Uh, the herpes can either be on the lips, which is caused by a virus called HHV1, herpes, human herpes viridae 1, virus 1, and or on the genitals, which is known as genital herpes or herpes genitalis, which again is a sexually transmitted disease where the blisters that occur, a bl it's a blistering virus because it's a, it's a latent virus that has uh, recurring lytic phases so every every now and then you get infected with herpes it hides in one of the nerves and then every now and then it comes out of the nerve and starts making a fuss by causing blisters by causing ulcers uh, and so it is a it is a latent virus that is actually a neurotropic virus okay and then we'll talk about the family hepadnaviridae which example we'll use is the hepatitis B virus, which is one of the more deadlier viruses that infect liver cells. Liver cells are called hepatocytes. Okay, so these are all group one viruses, Baltimore group one viruses, because they all have a double-stranded DNA genome. It doesn't matter whether it's linear or circular, although that's another way to tell them apart, but they all have a double-stranded DNA genome. Therefore, they are all members of the Baltimore group one of viruses, and they all fall into different families. Of the four of these that we're gonna study, only the family Poxviridae remains in the cytoplasm as an episome. Right, so the they, so the pox viridae replicates in the cytoplasm. It does not migrate to the nucleus of the cell, and it does not rely on the human DNA polymerase to make extra copies of it when it's reproducing itself. The other ones go to the nucleus, and they make use of the human RNA polymerase, which helps them to re, to, to make more viruses. All right, let's start with the Pox viridae family. So this is a this is a family of linear double-stranded DNA viruses. They have a single chromosome. It's linear, it's double-stranded. It remains in the cytoplasm. The shape of the capsid is complex. It's neither icosahedral nor helical. It's kind of bullet-shaped, uh, so they call it complex. And it does have an envelope. So it, it is surrounded by a layer of phospholipid bilayer, which it derived from the cell that it came out of. Right. So the variola virus is a member, variola virus is an exemplar, exemplar means an example of, right? So our, exam, our exemplar for the pox viridae family will be the variola virus, right? So the variola virus is a member of the, of the family pox viridae. It causes a disease called smallpox. It is very contagious. It's spread by droplet transmission. It enters through the respiratory system. But interestingly enough, it infects the epithelial cells of the lungs, so it's transmitted by droplet, it gets in through the lungs, but once it gets into the bloodstream, it goes out, it goes out to the skin and causes something called pustules, which are pus, you know, pus is uh, the remnants of dead white blood cells that form these lumps on the, these, these pus, pussy bumps on the skin, those are called pustules. Uh, that's one of the first phases, and it is very often lethal. Uh, smallpox, the variola virus which causes smallpox, has been eradicated as of the 1970s. The World Health Organization uh, helped to eradicate smallpox from the world by going all over the world and vaccinating people with a very successful smallpox vaccination. So uh, these are two. There are two. There are two very bad diseases that were causing misery all over the world that the World Health Organization, under the auspices of the United Nations, the World Health Organization uh, took vaccines for these two diseases all over the world and injected people with vaccination so they were immune to it. And smallpox and uh, polio are now officially eradicated. And we can thank the United Nations and the World Health Organization for that. So the next time you see cynical politicians on television telling you that the, that the World Health Organization is evil, just remind them that there would be millions of people who have smallpox and polio if not for the World Health Organization. Today, there would be millions of people with smallpox and polio, but they are not. Those people are not infected thanks to the World Health Organization. All right, so this has been officially eradicated by a vaccine. 
The smallpox, the variola viruses cause the, one of the symptoms is they cause pustules on the skin. Uh, so I'm going to show you some very disturbing images of what that looks like. So brace, either brace yourself or get somebody else to read, to, to look at this page for you. Okay, watch out for these images. All right, this is what pustules look like. This is what smallpox pustules look like. All right, now you can talk to the history teachers and the anthropology teachers, and they will no doubt tell you that sadly, when the Europeans went exploring North America and the South Pacific, they took smallpox with them. Many Europeans had been infected with smallpox and gotten over it so that they were immune to it, but they were still contagious. And so uh, some of these ships that carried the Europeans all over the world carried sailors that had smallpox that were carrying smallpox and they were transmitted to the to the native people in North America and the, the native people in the South Pacific and something like 40 percent of these populations were killed off wiped out by smallpox uh, and smallpox has a fairly high mortality rate okay now one of the interesting things about uh, so here we have a South Pacific, uh, a South Pacific inhabitant here on the left who's infected with smallpox. Notice the distribution of the pustules. With smallpox, the pustules are distributed in what's called a, a centrifugal pattern, which means it, it is not distributed in the middle. It's distributed at the outside, the periphery of the body. So the lower arms, the head, and the lower legs is where you would find most of the pustules, but not in the torso. Right. That is the opposite pattern of distribution that you see for chickenpox. So we're going to talk about chickenpox later. Chickenpox has a central distribution pattern, and smallpox has a centrifugal distribution pattern, which means that it, it looks like somebody has taken uh, somebody and spun them in a centrifuge so that the pustules ended up at the peripheral parts of their body as opposed to the center. Okay, so a centrifugal distribution pattern of pustules is a hallmark, it's a, it's a sign of smallpox, of pox viridae. Okay, so again, it is a group one linear double-stranded DNA virus with a complex uh, enveloped, uh, uh, a complex capsid and is an enveloped virus. It reproduces in the, sep it, it replicates in the cytoplasm. It causes pustules, which are raised bumps, which contain pus. Eventually the pustules will go away, they will recede, and then you will end up with terrible scars where the pustules used to be. So you get this scarring pattern in later age. So you might have seen a lot of old pictures, a lot of old black and white pictures from the early 20th century showing either, either Native Americans, particularly in the Midwest, or South Pacific people with scarred faces. And those scars were caught, those were the ravages of smallpox, what's left over from that. Okay, so they also infect, the, the, the virus also infected the lymph nodes, which are part of the lymphatic system. It has a 30% mortality rate, which meant that it was highly contagious, which meant that a lot of people caught it. And then of those people who caught it, 30% would die. So this was a very bad disease. Uh, the pustules are distributed centrifugally, as I said, and there is a vaccine available for this, which is why, which is how we were actually able to get rid of it. This is a narrow host range virus, so it does not have animal reservoirs. So if all the people who have smallpox either get over it or they die, which is sad to think about, but if they either, if everyone who has smallpox either gets over it, recovers, or dies, and everybody else is vaccinated, Essentially, you will have gotten rid of smallpox, and that's called eradication. So uh, smallpox was officially eradicated from the world in the 70s. Okay, let's move on to the papilloma viridae. The word papilloma is a fancy word meaning wart. Okay, so again, these are Baltimore group one viruses. They have a circular double-stranded DNA genome. They replicate as an episome, but the episome is located in the nucleus. They have a naked icosahedral capsid. Right, so here is a, papil uh, a papilloma viridae, member of the papilloma viridae, papoma, uh, papoviridae, which is a member of that family. Right, so the papo papoviridae family, also known as papilloma viridae, they cause papillomas, right, papillomas. 
Right? So they are an epitheliotrophic virus that infects the skin surface. It infects the epithelial cells that make up the skin surface. As you remember, may, maybe you remember from Biology 120, epithelial tissue means the outer layer of, of tissue, including the skin, but also the, the skin is the outer layer of the body, but it also includes the inside of hollow compartments. So the inside of the lungs, the tissue that lines the inside of the lungs is classified as epitheliotropic, epithelial tissue rather. The, the tissue tissue that lines the inside of the intestine and the stomach and the inside of the blood vessels is also classified as epithelial tissue. Okay, generally, the, the papillomaviruses, papillomaviruses are spread through skin-to-skin -skin transmission. That means anything from a handshake, anything as casual as a handshake to anything as intimate as sexual intercourse, sexual contact. And so if you have a wart on your hand, the odds are you got that by shaking hands with somebody who had a wart. So if you do have a wart, if you develop a wart on your hand, you, you should cover it up and then have it removed because you will give it to other people. Right? So that's why warts should be removed because they are contagious. They are contagious. Um, well, they're not, I, I apologize. They're not contagious, they're communicable. Uh, they are communicable. They're not easily spread from person to person. Uh, there is one interesting exception to that, and that's that in the, in the 1960s and 70s, the, the method for getting rid of, this is a little bit disturbing to think about, but in the 60s and, 50s and 60s and 70s, if you went to the doctor to have a wart removed, they used to burn it away with a hot needle. So they used to give you an injection of painkiller to localize, get to, 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 to uh, lessen the pain in the local area. And then they would take a hot needle, which is sort of like a soldering iron, and then they would basically fry the, they would fry the wart off of your skin. It would, they would burn it off. And that burning would cause the, the wart to vaporize into the air. And the doctor who was doing it, the dermatologist, a dermatologist is a doctor who cares for skin, the dermatologists would inhale it. And then in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was a large uh, occurrence of dermatologists who ended up getting warts inside their noses. And somebody figured out that that's because when you burn it like that, you burn away the wart, it, it vaporizes into the air, and then you inhale it. So let's find some other way to remove them. And so in the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s and beyond, they developed either chemical means to get rid of warts or they freeze them off with liquid nitrogen. So instead of burning the wart off, these days a dermatologist will either cut it off or they will freeze it off with liquid, nit liquid nitrogen. So they'll freeze it and then break it off. Okay, so that is a little bit disturbing to think about. But anyway, that's, you know, this course is not a pretty course. The microbiology diseases, the microbi microbial diseases are not pretty at all. Okay, so HPV-16, there are several different members of the, of the papilloma, uh, of, the, of the human papilloma viridae family. And so HPV-6 causes warts, just ordinary warts that you spread by shaking somebody's hand. And then HPV-16 causes genital warts. It's a common uh, sexually transmitted disease. And so it causes warts on the, to appear on the genitals, the reproductive organs of both men and women, but it also causes cervical cancer in women. And luckily there is a vaccine for it. So women can get vaccinated against cervical cancer that is caused by HPV-16. Okay, now how did people figure out that cervical cancer was caused by HPV-16? It's, cervical cancer can be caused by several different methods, but one of the main causes of cervical cancer is HPV-16. So how did people figure that out? Well, you can, also, you can, uh, you can ask how many people who, ha who develop cervical cancer uh, how many women who develop cervical cancer also have genital warts caused by HPV-16? It's very high. The number is very high. I believe it's in the 90 percent or something like that. So the number of there, there, the the occurrence of cervical cancer with genital warts, there's a high correlation between those two things, meaning that they often happen together. Okay. The the epidemiologist also noticed something else that was interesting. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you about. Okay, so a papilloma is a wart, right? So it's caused by skin-to-skin -skin transmission. It generally stays in the epidermal layer and causes warts and also cervical cancer. Uh, 
they use, as I said, they used to remove them. You should generally remove them because you can transmit them to other people. All right, this is what I was going to tell you. Okay, so cervical, how did they figure out about the connection between cervical cancer and HPV-16? Well, what the epidemiologists, their job is to look at what do all the people who have this disease have in common and what do the people who don't have it have in common. And one of the things that they noticed with their, was that there was a very low occurrence of, H, there was a very low occurrence of cervical cancer in Catholic nuns. Right. So what is it that nuns do or don't do that other women do do? And that is one of the things is to have sex. Right. So so they figured out that that there is a correlation between sexual intercourse and cervical cancer. They dig they, they, they investigated a little further and they realized that there was a strong correlation between having genital warts as a result of HPV-16 and having cervical cancer. And they came to the conclusion that HPV-16 causes cervical cancer. So they developed a vaccine against it. And the vaccine is a very good, useful vaccine that prevents cervical cancer that is caused by HPV-16 infection. Okay, now whenever you get a disease, a sexually transmitted disease, you run into tricky, the tricky ground, the tricky morass of morality. And so what happens in this thing, what happens with S sexually transmitted diseases is usually most people want to find a way to cure them or prevent them. But you have a few people who, who are scoffing at the idea, they dislike the idea of people having sex, or they dislike the idea of people having sex except in marriage, right? So there, there are many people in the world, uh, you know, myself included, I don't, I don't like the idea of having sex outside of marriage, but I don't find it that, that distasteful. It's just one, one of many things that people do. People are flawed. Uh, but some people are so opposed to it, they'll do anything to prevent it. And, and to, they'll do anything to prevent it, including making sure that people remain scared of sexually transmitted diseases. So they'll say, well, let's not find a cure or a prevention for these sexually transmitted diseases, because if people are scared that they will catch these diseases, they will stop having sex, at least outside of marriage. Uh, what about sex inside of marriage? There are lots of couples that where one, one member of the couple has a sexually transmitted disease and the other one doesn't. We still need to have some method to prevent the, the member of the, the partner in the relationship who doesn't have uh, the sexually transmitted disease. So we do, we do need to investigate these things. But anyway, we get mixed up with this morality among sexually transmitted diseases. Right? So I just wanted to digress and tell you a little example that I find is amusing, which is that during the First World War, when men used to fight each other in airplanes, these biplanes, they used to shoot each other down in airplanes. The, the airplane was invented, and not long after the airplane was invented, they invented the parachute. And so the pilots who were flying these airplanes said, why don't we get parachutes? And the the generals who were running the war decided we're not we're going to forbid pilots from wearing a parachute because if they wear a parachute, as soon as they get into trouble, right? So here you have the Red Baron on your tail, and he's about to shoot you down. Why don't you just jump out of the plane so you won't be killed? And so the the generals who were running the war said we're not going to we're not going to allow pilots to wear parachutes because that would they would simply chicken out every time they're about to get into a dangerous situation and they'll jump out of the plane. Now that may sound like a laughable attitude now, and it is, an, it is a laughable attitude, but we have, or many people have the same attitude about sexually transmitted diseases. And that is, they say, we, we shouldn't teach people how to avoid catching sexually transmitted diseases because that will simply encourage them to, to, to do to be promiscuous and we disapprove of promiscuity. So therefore let's not find cures for sexual, sexually transmitted diseases. Let's not find ways to prevent them or cure them. And then people will be good. Well, personally, I think that's a ridiculous attitude, but many people have that attitude even, even subconsciously without realizing it. Uh, but I think there's nothing, personally, I think there's nothing more immoral than knowing how to stop somebody from dying from a sexually transmitted disease and not telling them how to avoid death from sexually transmitted diseases. Right, so that's my attitude. Other people may have different attitudes. That's my opinion. Okay, so the, uh, the, the HPV-16 vaccine has run into this problem with moralism. Okay, so this is an advertisement which was made by high school, a group of high school girls 
uh, where th th this, I didn't write this banner up here at the top. It says, listen up, the HPV vaccine does not lead to promiscuity. And then these girls all have a sticker on their arm that says that. And they're just saying, you know, we're, we're being safe. We were vaccinated against HPV. Better to be safe than sorry. Don't have the attitude that you're not going to vaccinate us because you think that'll make us virtuous. Okay, so that there's a there's a movement to suppress use of the HPV-16 vaccine, and there's a movement against the movement to suppress it. All right, here's a little bit of history. Again, this is a digression. You can fast forward through this part if you find it boring. But here's a little bit of American history. You know, we live here in Canada, right next to the United States, and we often we often watch their politics, and we're amused and entertained, and sometimes horrified by their politics. But here is an interesting example from history. So you know who this guy is up here on the top left, right? That's Barack Obama. And he was the president of the United States from 19, uh, oh, sorry, 2000, from 2008, 2009 until uh, 2016. Uh, and so there are two political parties in the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans. Do you know which party Obama belongs to? Okay, so. Barack Obama belongs to the Democratic Party, which has a more which takes a more liberal attitude towards social issues like sexually transmitted diseases. And the other party, which Donald Trump belongs to and a lot of the other George W. Bush belonged to, was the Republican Party, which has a more conservative, traditionally conservative attitude towards uh, sexual promiscuity or whatnot and has a it tends to be historically has tended to be very resistant to finding ways to cure or prevent sexually transmitted diseases okay now who are these two guys in the bottom okay so these two guys when Barack Obama was running for re-election in 2012 the Republican Party had to come up with a candidate to run against Barack Obama and these two guys were the leading candidates in the Republican Party the guy on the left is Mitt Romney, who who uh, got the nomination, and the guy on the right was the governor of Texas, a, a man named Rick Perry, who did not, but he came very close to getting it. But he was Rick Perry. the The Republicans chose not to not to pick Rick Perry to run against Barack Obama in 2012 because Rick Perry supported uh, injecting or vaccinating teenage girls against human papillomavirus. Now, he was the governor of Texas, and if you're going to be the governor of Texas, you have to be kind of a cowboy if you want to show off and be a cowboy and be popular. So Rick Perry often had these pictures of him firing guns into the air and riding, riding horses and things like that. So he was a typical Texas cowboy. And so uh, here's a nice political cartoon that I like. This political cartoon, you know, when you have cowboys from the old movies, gunslingers, they draw their guns, and if they if they pull the trigger too fast, they'll end up shooting themselves through the foot. That's where the metaphor shooting yourself in the foot comes from. It's an expression that, that you often hear in English, you shot yourself in the foot, which means that you, you did something stupid, and instead of shooting the guy that you, that's trying to shoot you, you ended up shooting yourself. And so here there's a cartoon showing why Rick Perry, the potential 2012 candidate, shot himself in the foot, not with a gun, a pistol, but with a with a vaccine, with a uh, HPV vaccine. So that's just an interesting thing that basically one of the things that Rick Perry did, one of the few things that Rick Perry ever did that I thought made a lot of sense was what actually cost him the nomination for the to run against Barack Obama in 2012. Okay, so this is another cartoon illustrating that kind of attitude. So you see here, there's a there's a woman in bed dying from cervical cancer, and the doctor has a chart here that says HPV-induced cervical cancer. And then the doctor is saying to her parents, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but your daughter has... And then the parents are shocked that she's having sex, right? So uh, this, is, uh, this is just another illustration of the attitudes, back and forth attitudes between treatments and preventions for sexually transmitted diseases. Okay, so the human papillomavirus family, the papillomaviridae family, which is also sometimes known as the papov papovaviridae family, causes papillomas. Papillomas are warts. They are epitheliotropic, usually transmitted through skin to skin. They are communicable but not contagious. Uh, you actually have to touch the person that's infected in order to get it yourself. 
uh, two examples that we learned about are HPV6, which causes regular warts, HPV16, which causes genital warts, and also cervical cancer in women. There is a cervical cancer, there is a vaccine that prevents HPV16, but its use is controversial. All right, let's move on to the herpes viridae family. Okay, so there are actually several important members of the herpes viridae family. They all have a linear double-stranded DNA genome. They have an icosahedral enveloped capsid. So they have an icosahedral capsid surrounded by an envelope that was derived from the plasma membrane of the host cell. They replicate as an episome. The episome is located in the nucleus. Right, so there's a picture of a herpes, a herpes virus. Right. Okay, now there are several important members of the herpes viridae of the herpes viridae family. There are several important herpes viruses. HHV1, human herpes virus 1, causes cold sores, which are generally these little blisters that you get on your lips, and you usually get these from kissing somebody that has the blister already. So if you if you're going to kiss somebody, first take a look at their lips to make sure that they don't have a blister. That blister could be an HHV1 uh, herpes, human herpes viridae 1 uh, cold sore blister that is, that is contagious, right, communicable. So if you kiss somebody with one of those blisters on their lip, you may end up getting HHV1 yourself. Okay, next, if you're going to have sex with somebody, look at their genitals to make sure that there are no blisters around the genitals because that could be caused by human herpes viridae virus 2, which causes a disease called herpes genitalis, which is an ugly blistering disease of the genitals. It's not terribly, it's not deadly, it's not even terribly irritating, but it is unsightly. So th th these two are, these two HHV1 and HHV2 are contracted from kissing or sexual intercourse. Um, they're not terribly lethal, but they are, they, they are annoying, right? And there is no vaccine for either one of those. Okay, here's our old friend, the varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox in children and shingles in adults. It is, uh, there, is a uh, there is a vaccine to prevent it, right? So many children get it. And then finally, the HHV4 is also known as the Epstein-Barr virus. So just remember that HHV3 and HHV4, those stand for human herpes virus 3 and human herpes virus 4, but they also have alternative names. And the alternative name for HHV3 is varicella zoster virus, right? So many times on final exams, I say, what is, what is the alternative name for varicella zoster virus? And you would answer HHV3. Or I might say, what's the alternative name for HHV4? And then you would say the Epstein-Barr virus. Okay, so the Epstein-Barr virus is, th these are all, all four of these are latent viruses. Three of the four establish their latency period. So establish latency means where do they hide? What part of, where do, what part of the body do they go to hide? So all three, the first three of them, HHV1, 2, and 3, establish their latency period. They hide in neurons. They hide in nerves. Right? HHV4 establishes latency in B cells, which are white blood cells, which are part of the immune system. Okay, so HHV1, 2, and 3 cause ulcers or blisters that may vary in size. You know that chickenpox, for instance, you just get little tiny small red spots, uh, whereas herpes uh, HHV1 and HHV2 give larger, uglier sores. Okay, looking at the top two. They're, they're basically, they're very similar viruses. It just so happens that HHV1 is usually spread by kissing and HHV2 is usually spread by sexual activity. Okay, so here is a, this is what a herpes uh, cold sore looks like, this little blister, right? So if you ever see somebody, if you're ever planning to kiss somebody and you see that on their lip, do not kiss them because you'll get HHV1 yourself. On the other hand, if you're, if you're, deeply in love with somebody who already has this, the good news is that you can kiss them when they're not contagious. And so uh, HHV1 and HHV2 both reoccur intermittently, so they appear and they, they cause a blister. And you don't want to touch that blister because you'll catch the virus. But then when the blister goes away and, and stays away for several weeks, it's okay to touch them, right? So it's okay to kiss them or have, have sex with them when, when they are not actively forming a blister. Okay, so the 
HHV1 herpes, human herpes 1 is a latent, uh, it establishes a latency period. So it starts out as a blister on the lip and then it, it sets up house, it hides in the trigeminal ganglion, which is part of one of the nerves on your face. And so what happens is you start with the blister on your lip and then the virus basically runs up to the ganglion up here and then hides for a while. And then it runs back down the ganglion and reappears on the lip again. And so it just goes back and forth. The viruses, I mean, they don't literally, an individual virus doesn't run up and down the, the facial nerve like that. But, but the viruses will disappear from the skin, and, but they'll remain in the, in the trigeminal ganglion. And then they will move every now and then, they will move from the trigeminal ganglion down the facial nerve to the lip again and cause a blister. Intermittently, they will do that. So classic behavior of a latent virus. Right? So if I ever ask you for an example, or give me two examples of latent viruses, you can say HHV1 and HHV2, or varicella zoster virus, any of those would be good, or Epstein-Barr virus, any of those four would be good examples of latent viruses. And then you would have to tell me where they establish latency and how the, what form they take when, they're, when they are active. Okay, so these are HHV, uh, sorry, HHV1 and 2 are neurotrophic viruses that cause ulcers or blisters. Right? They can either be active or latent. When they are active, they're causing a blister either on the lips or on the genitalia, the sex organs. Or they can be latent where, when they are hiding inside neurons, inside nerves. Right? So HHV1 sometimes spreads to the throat and to the gums and causes an illness called gingivostomatis. Gingivostomatis, stomatitis rather, is an in fact basically it's an infection of the gums and sometimes the sometimes the tonsils. Uh, certainly it causes blisters of the lip, right? So nerves in the face, it establishes latency in the trigeminal trigeminal ganglia that services the nerves in the face. Okay, then HHV2 causes herpes genitalis. It's, it's a sexually transmitted disease, and it hides in the lumbar nerves. Those are the nerves that come out of the spinal, the lower, the lower spinal vertebra in your back, right? So the, the nerves in your lower back is where HHV2 hides, and those nerves connect the spine to the sex organs. And so if they're hiding up near the lumbar vertebra in your back, occasionally they go down and they show themselves on the sex organs in the form of a blister. Okay, so HHV2 causes herpes genitalis. It has, it's a sexually transmitted disease. It hides in the nerves coming out of the lumbar vertebra of the back. And occasionally, if a, if a pregnant woman has uh, HHV2, if, if the blisters are actively forming while she's giving birth, Sometimes the baby can contract it and develop something called herpes meningitis or herpes encephalitis. Meningitis, of course, is the inflammation of the tissues around the brain, and encephalitis is where the entire brain and spinal cord becomes inflamed. And for a baby, that can be that could be fatal. Uh, and so it, it it and it enters the eyes of the baby as the baby is on the way out of the vagina. Right. So. Uh, if the woman is actually uh, is actively having a herpes eruption during birth, the birth time, they might want to think about another way to do it, like a cesarean section. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that, but the, I think I believe that's what they might do. Okay, let's move on to HHV3, also known as varicella zoster virus. It has droplet transmission. It causes latent infections, and the latent infections, uh, the virus hides. It establishes latency in the thoracic nerves, uh, the nerves that come out of the thoracic vertebra of the back. So that's any of the any of the parts of the spine that are connected to the ribs, basically the chest area, right? The chest area, the thorax. You have on the front of the chest and the back of the chest, you can have um, uh, the, the nerves that enter the spinal column at that level. Those are good hiding places for varicella zoster virus. So you catch varicella zoster virus, and then this disease is called varicella when you have it when you're a child. Notice the distribution of the red spots, the little red blisters. This, this is the opposite of what we saw with, with the smallpox virus. 
these are centrally distributed. Right, so the smallpox, we have central distribution as opposed to peripheral uh, centrifugal distribution. Okay, and so then the, you, you get smallpox for a while, that's called varicella. When you're a child, it then goes away. And then it returns again when you're, it, what it does actually is it hides inside the, the thoracic nerves, the, it hides inside the nerves coming out of the thoracic vertebra. And then it reappears 20, 30 years later as a, as a disease called zoster. The zo disease zoster has the common name shingles, shingles. Right, because it kind of forms these kind of, and, and what it's doing here is, well, those of you that took biology 130 know that this, this is a dermatone. So these, the body is, the nerves that service the skin divide the skin up into bands of flesh, basically, so you, uh, that are called dermatones. And so the varicella zoster virus was hiding in one of the nerves that services that particular dermatone. So this is a map of the human dermatones, right? So you see this is thoracic uh, dermatone 2, thoracic dermatone 3, 4, and so on. And so the, the virus was hiding inside one of the nerves that comes out of one of these thoracic vertebra, probably that one, right? And then when it came out, it ended up there, causing blisters to the skin right there. Uh, you should be aware of the fact that, that both uh, both varicella and zoster can be spread through contaminated clothing. Uh, so if you have somebody in the house who is, who has uh, zoster, who has shingles, you have to be sure that you wash their, you wash their clothes separately from everybody else's clothes, and then use very hot water in the in the laundry machine, in the washing machine. Don't use cold water to save energy if somebody has either varicella or zoster in the house. Uh, because it can be transmitted through clothing that gets mixed together in the washing machine. So be aware of that. Okay, now let's move on to HHV4, which is, uh, which is, which is also known as the Epstein-Barr virus. It causes a disease called infectious mononucleosis, which is often spread by kissing. Uh, it can infect the entire pharynx, so you get these swollen tonsils and so on. And later on, some people, some researchers believe that there is a connection between getting mononucleosis when you're young and getting chronic fatigue syndrome when you're old. Right? So chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, I don't believe that the relationship has been established. Every other week, somebody publishes a paper that says there is a connection between Epstein-Barr virus and chronic fatigue syndrome, and then every other week somebody publishes a paper that says there isn't a connection. We don't know the answer yet, but, but that's an active area of research. Okay, so the HHV4 is spread by droplet transmission and more commonly by saliva transmission, which is transmitted when you're kissing somebody. So this disease is spread by kissing. Right, so Epstein-Barr virus, people generally catch it. It's it's fairly widespread, as a matter of fact. People generally catch it when they're in their when they're in their teens or early 20s when they start kissing people on a serious level. Uh, they start kissing people with some regularity, and so a lot of people end up catching mononucleosis, and in 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 middle age potentially could have uh, could have chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so, so um, HHV4, Epstein-Barr virus, infects B cells, which are, par which are white blood cells. So that's where it establishes its latency period. Okay, I'll show you some images. Brace yourself. All right, so these are HHV1, uh, herpes cold sores. Right, this is inflammation of the entire tonsil area, the pharyngitis, which is a characteristic of mononucleosis, or, a, or uh, which is caused by HHV4. And HHV4 is caused by kissing, so is HHV1 uh, uh, cold sore herpes. Right, HHV1, HHV4, both cause generally, usually contracted through kissing. All right, so herpes viridae family, they have linear double-stranded DNA genomes, one, a single chromosome, no, so no chromosome reassortment. They have an icosahedral capsid and they are enveloped. Replicate is an episome, right? So we, we, now we, we know all about the four different important members of the herpes viridae family. 
let's move on to the Hepadnaviridae family. Hepadna, Hepa refers refers to Hepa refers to liver cells, right? The word hepatotropic means infects the liver, and DNA means they have a DNA genome, right? So the name of this virus family is very convenient because it tells us that they are they are hepatotrophic viruses that have a DNA genome. In this particular this particular one, the only only member of the hepad, hepadnaviridae family that we care about in this case is hepatitis B virus. It causes hepatitis or and hepatomegaly. So hep, hepatitis is where the liver becomes infected with this virus and it swells up and becomes irritated, and some of the tissue actually dies. If some of the tissue of the liver dies, it gets replaced with scar uh, scar tissue instead of healthy liver tissue. And when that happens, that's referred to as cirrhosis of the liver, cirrhosis of the liver. So the liver, the healthy liver tissue that's filtering the nutrients that are extracted from your intestine when you eat. So we eat, the food is broken down in the intestine, but before the nutrients that are absorbed by the intestine can be sent into the bloodstream, they have to be filtered through the liver. So the liver filters and detoxify, detoxifies the food that we eat. If your liver breaks down, then you have all of these poisons that get circulating in your blood and that, that will eventually kill you. And the way that that happens is that the liver tissue, the liver doesn't die all of a sudden, little bits of it here and there will die from time to time and be replaced with scar tissue. And eventually you get a liver that's the regular full size, but only 10% of it is actually functional liver tissue and the other 90% is just scar tissue. So that's referred to as cirrhosis of the liver and that's usually why uh, hepatitis B is deadly. So hepatitis B can be deadly because it does cause cirrhosis of the liver and, and could cause the liver to die eventually. Right. So how is it transmitted? Uh, it is generally transmitted through fomite transmission due to intravenous drug use. Intravenous drug abuse is what it should be called. And it can also be transmitted through sexual intercourse as well, uh, particularly with the transmission of bodily fluids. So uh, transmission of if, if a person who has hepatitis B can have sex with another person who doesn't have it provided that they use a condom for instance because it's the it's the transmission of bod bodily fluids between people that cause uh, particularly uh, semen for instance right which so so it's much easier for a man who has hepatitis C to give the hepatitis C to a woman who doesn't have it than the reverse because you know the man deposits semen into the woman's body whereas if if he uses a condom he won't right so the condom is meant to prevent transmission of bodily fluids to the other person okay now an interesting thing is that if you work in a hospital because hepatitis C you, hepatitis C is transmitted through fomite transmission including needles if you're a nurse or a doctor or a phlebotomist who works in the hospital, you have, usually have to have a hepatitis B vaccination. So there is a vaccine that prevents hepatitis B, prevents you from catching hepatitis B. And if you work in a hospital as a healthcare worker, you are required, usually it's a condition of employment, that you are required to get the hepatitis B vaccine or you're not allowed to work in the hospital. And the reason for that is because if you're working in a hospital, you will have some patients that have hepatitis B. And if you work handling those patients long enough, eventually you're accidentally going to take a blood sample from one of them and accidentally poke yourself with the needle that's contaminated with their blood. And so this will prevent you from getting their hepatitis B. Right. So anyone who wants the hepatitis B vaccine can get it. Anybody who wants it can get it. But if you work in a hospital, if you become a doctor or a nurse or a phlebotomist who's somebody who takes blood samples, you would probably be required to have the hepatitis B vaccine. All right, so hepa the hepadnaviridae family has a circular double-stranded DNA genome. It's an icosahedral virus that's surrounded by an envelope. It uncoats when it gets into, the, into a cell and it goes to the nucleus and then it's replicated as an episome. It does not integrate into the chromosomes. 
As I said, one of the most common ways to catch it is through intravenous drug abuse, uh, intravenous drug users. As I told you earlier on in this course, one of the dirty secrets of Vancouver, one of the dirty secrets of Canada is that we have a problem with intravenous drug use. Um, I can't tell you, you can talk to the anthropologist about why this might be the case uh, and why law enforcement can't to stop people from selling these drugs and stop, therefore stop people from getting addicted to them. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer that the healthcare professionals have given to this problem, which is to, okay, if, if the healthcare, you know, healthcare professionals are not police, they can't go out and arrest drug dealers, but, but the least they can do is to provide the drug users with clean needles so that they don't give each other hepatitis B or, as we'll talk about later, uh, HIV. So, uh, the one of the pro, you know, the the drug abuse, IV drug abuse, is a terrible thing because it completely destroys your life, destroys your personality. It's a terrible, terrible thing. But the worst part of it is that it's often accompanied by, because of, due to the lifestyle that's associated with drug use, it is often, it is often accompanied by infections of hepatitis B or AIDS, right? So the healthcare professionals have taken the attitude that, look, we don't like this solution, but until you come up with a better solution, we have to do this because we can't stop the IV drug addiction and we can't stop, stop the drug dealers from selling drugs. But the least we can do is stop these drug addicts from giving each other hepatitis B and AIDS. So that's, that was the idea behind the safe injection site. So I mentioned that Canada has a drug, an intravenous drug abuse problem. Vancouver is the center, the epicenter of that problem. And Hastings and Main Street, the area of, between Hastings and Main and Hastings and Carroll in downtown Vancouver is the epicenter of that drug problem. There are, there are more drug, IV drug addicts there than anywhere else in the world, basically. And, and different people have different ideas about how to address this problem. I support the idea of the safe injection site. I don't like it. Most people who are involved with it don't like it, but it's better than nothing. So again, this is a, a small solution to a big problem. The healthcare professionals have done their part, done what they can, what done what it's within their power to do. The legal people have to work on the other side of the problem as well. Right, so the safe in, there's, there are three safe injection sites in Vancouver. If a drug addict comes in, the, the safe injection site obviously does not sell them any drugs. They have to buy the drugs from their whoever sells them their drugs. But the, once the addict comes into the safe injection site, the, there's a nurse inside who will give them a clean needle and then talk to them and say, you know, if you, you don't have to live like this, if you don't want to, there are treatment programs. And the nurse will also offer them some food, right? Because many drug IV drug addicts are starving. Right. So the nurse will give them a clean needle, offer them some food, offer, offer them some pamphlets, which talk about uh, programs to help them get free of drugs. And this program is very successful in preventing drug overdose, very successful in preventing the spread of hepatitis C and AIDS, and somewhat successful, better than nothing, at convincing people to enter programs that help them to get cured of drug addiction. So I'm very in favor of this. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but I happen to be very in favor of this particular solution. Okay, another interesting thing about hepatitis B is that it's one of the few viruses that you can't really kill by boiling the fomites. So it's transmitted by fomites, and if you boil the needles, that won't necessarily kill. Let's say you have IV drug users. Uh, one of the things that they used to do was boil the needles before they loaned them to each other. Uh, to inject drugs, and it turned out that doesn't really stop the spread of hepatitis B. So hepatitis B is a rare virus that doesn't is not really killed easily by boiling. Okay, now the the, the one of the consequences of that is that one of the most dangerous places that you can have hepatitis B is on dental instruments, right? The, so dental instruments, and that's why dentists have to make sure that they sterilize their dental instruments with a machine called an autoclave, which we'll talk about later. So the autoclave uh, is used to sterilize metal instruments that you use for dentistry. Okay, now here's an interesting story about something that happened here in Vancouver a couple of years ago. 
apparently there was a there was a dentist who was working not in a dentist office but he was working in his bedroom right so he had a house in burnaby and he had converted one of the bedrooms into a dental clinic and he was offering discount dental services right so one of the reasons why he was offering a discount was because he didn't have to pay for an office and he didn't have an autoclave either he would simply boil his dental instruments and so he was practicing dentistry in Burnaby without a license and he had a very lo loyal clientele who were people who didn't have dental insurance and they were glad to find a dentist who would charge only a few dollars for various dental procedures but once they discovered that this was going on the police issued a warrant for his arrest and he he tried to flee the he fled the area he ended they ended up catching him in in, uh, in Toronto I think uh and the 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 police may, went on television and warned all of his patients that they should go and be they should go to their doctor and be checked for hepatitis B and AIDS because this guy did not have an autoclave to sterilize his instruments. So there's a very good reason why we license people to practice dentistry and license people to practice medicine and because then we can inspect their offices and make sure they have all the equipment that they're supposed to have that's one of the that's one of the useful things that government does and and which government must do so it turned out that this guy that the that guy who was known as the bedroom dentist he he was he was uh, humorously referred to as the be, the bedroom dentist of Burnaby uh he he in his home he did not have a machine like this which is called an autoclave which can be used to sterilize the dental instruments uh that instrument costs about $10,000 uh, he didn't have that. He was simply boiling the dental instruments to clean them up. And so that, that isn't enough to, to sufficiently clean away the hepatitis B or the AIDS virus, but particularly the hepatitis B virus. Okay, so hepatitis B, fomite transmission. Uh, it infects the liver. Okay, this is what cirrhosis of the liver looks like. That's how you spell the word cirrhosis, right? So here we have a normal liver made of normal healthy hepatocytes liver cells and here we have a cirrhotic liver where the uh, every every here and there the the the, lo the lo lobules the little individual cells that make the liver function have been dying off and the tissue is being replaced by scar tissue instead and so the liver is not really working at 100 percent capacity anymore you get down to the point where the liver, liver is working at 10 or 20 percent capacity it can't filter out the toxins that you're eating from your food and so you generally die so this is a dissected view of a healthy liver and this is a dissected view of this kind of lumpy liver that's filled with nodules of scar tissue I mentioned the fact that if you work in a hospital, it's a requirement of employment. You're required, it's a condition of employment that you are vaccinated for hepatitis B. Right, so the idea is that you give so many injections to people and some of those people might have hepatitis B that the odds are that one day you will accidentally poke yourself with a needle that's contaminated with hepatitis B contaminated blood. And so in order to, to be that kind of a healthcare worker, you generally, you are forced to, you know, they just say you, you don't have to work at this hospital, but if you do, you have to be vaccinated against hepatitis B. <clears throat> Okay, now interestingly, hepatitis B is capable of transplacental infections, also causes cirrhosis of the liver. If you have complete failure of the liver due to cirrhosis of the liver, that's called fulminant hepatitis. So you should learn that word, fulminant hepatitis, right? And so it, as we said before, it has a circular DNA chromosome. It, it remains as an episome in the nucleus where it replicates. There's a vaccine, by the way, there's a vaccine for hepatitis A and B, but not for hepatitis C. We're only talking about hepatitis B in this section because only hepatitis B is a member of the hepatinoviridae family. Right? The other ones are members of other virus families, which we'll talk about later. Okay, let's move on to some famous RNA virus families. Okay, remember that RNA viruses sustain mutations rapidly, which means they are capable, all of these viruses are capable of genetic drift or antigenic drift. Antigenic drift refers to the slow change of the proteins on the viral surface, which leads to several different serotypes, right? So the, 
Generally, the DNA viruses have only one or two serotypes, but the RNA viruses change the proteins on the surface of their capsid more regularly because of due to antigenic drift, the slow accumulation of uh, mutations in an RNA genome. Right? So all of these viruses are capable of antigenic drift, and some of them are cap some of the RNA viruses, as you know, are capable of antigenic shift, specifically the influenza viruses. Okay, but here we're not talking about, in, well, we're talking about influenza when we get partway through this list, but not all of these can do antigenic shift, but all of them can do antigenic drift. Okay, so first, the family Picornaviridae. Pico means small, RNA refers to the RNA genome. The example we're going to talk about is the poliovirus, which causes poliomyelitis. Then we'll talk about the rhinoviridae family, which causes colds. Rhinovirus causes colds. We'll talk about the flaviviridae family, which includes the hepatitis C virus. Right, so hepatitis, we were just talking about hepatitis B. We'll talk about hepatitis C momentarily. The rhabdoviridae cause rabies. So rhabdo, rabies, rhabdo, rabies. Right, the orthomyxoviridae are the ones that can mix their chromosomes, chromosome rearrangements. Influenza virus is the example we'll learn. And then the retroviridae or the retroviruses, the HIV virus or the AIDS virus is the example we'll use. Beginning with the picoviridae family, right? So these are the polio example. Poliovirus is an example of the of the picornaviridae family. So are the rhinoviruses that cause colds, and so is the hepatitis A virus. These are single-stranded RNA viruses that have one chromosome, and the chromosome has a plus polarity. That means that the RNA, the virus, gets into the cell and it uncoats. It comes out of the capsid and it immediately loads the genome onto a ribosome, and the ribosome just treats it as if it was any other messenger RNA and starts making new viruses. Okay, So the capsid, it's a small capsid. That's, why, that's what the word pico means. So it a, has a small icosahedral capsid, and it's a naked virus, so it does not have a plasma membrane surrounding the capsid. And it replicates, it carries out its entire life cycle inside the cytoplasm. No part of the picoviridae, uh, picornaviridae family ever go into the nucleus. Okay, so we mentioned poliovirus already in the last lecture. It was eradicated by a vaccine thanks to the March of Dimes and also the World Health Organization. Uh, in the in the early 20th century, people had no idea how it was really spread. In fact, it was usually spread by people swimming in contaminated swimming pools. That's one of the reasons why now we chlorinate the swimming pools because uh, you know we're very careful to make sure that swimming pools are never contaminated by sewage because the uh, because the polio virus was usually caught by the oral fecal route. Uh, mean, mean, usually meaning that you, were, you would swallow some contaminated water while you were swimming in water that was contaminated by bodily fluids of other people or by sewage. And so poliovirus had an oral fecal route. Most people who got polio got what was called abortive polio. Abortive polio means that it doesn't result in your being paralyzed. A few people would end up getting meningitis and a stiff neck. Some people would get uh, about 1% of the time, the person who had polio would get flaccid paralysis, which means you can't move. And then not, the entire body wasn't necessarily affected, so we showed those terrible, sad pictures of children inside iron lungs. Those children were completely paralyzed. They were, they were unable to breathe, so that's why they were in the iron lung. So that was complete flaccid paralysis. And then you saw the example of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president of the United States during World War II and during the Great Depression. He was simply paralyzed from the waist down. Okay, so about 1% of the people who were infected with polio actually develop full-blown flaccid paralysis. Right, so 1% this would happen to you. 1% of the people who catch polio would have this happen to them. Uh, that's more than enough because that's a terrible state to be in. Rhinoviruses cause colds. Um, they are, they like, the, uh, they're epitheliotrophic, particularly for the cells in the nasopharynx inside the nose and behind the, in the sinuses. Uh, 
so they t generally infect they start inside your nose and they infect your upper respiratory tract that's your basically the 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 area behind your nose and your mouth the nasopharynx uh they are able to, their viral attachment proteins attach to a protein on the surface of those cells called icam1 right, so the so the cells inside your nose and inside your throat and inside your sinuses have a protein on their surface that's called ICAM-1 and the viral attachment proteins, the spikes that are on the surface of the rhinovirus are able to attach to those and they're therefore gain entry. Okay, now it's rhinoviruses carry out antigenic drift, which means that there are many different variants and we call the variants serovars if we're able to identify them using antibodies. And so there are over a hundred different serovars of colds. And so what happens is you catch a cold, you get over it, your body leaves behind memory cells and you never catch the same serovar twice. So why do you have a cold every year? That's because you're catching different serovars. And so you will notice that as you get older, at the more colds that you've caught, the fewer times you'll catch a cold, right? So I noticed that when I was when I was between the ages of one and ten, I used to catch three or four colds a year. Um, now I'm in my fifties and I I catch one cold about every two years. And the reason for that is because I've gone through a lot of the serovars in the last 50 years. I've already caught and become immune to a lot of the serovars. Uh, so. That's why you tend to catch fewer colds as you get older. Okay, hepatitis A is generally it's a subclinical form of hepatitis, means meaning that most people who catch it don't even realize they have it. But if you're old or infirm, or if you have an immunocompromise, if you have a problem with your immune system, you might catch it and it could be dangerous for your liver. Uh, hepatitis A is usually caught through the oral fecal route. In fact, what usually happens is that it is usually caught because uh, somebody who prepares your food goes to the washroom and they don't clean their hands to get rid of all of the feces under their fingernails. It gets into your food, you eat it, and then you have hepatitis A. Fortunately, there's a hepatitis A vaccine that anyone can take if they want, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an attenuated oral vaccine. So you simply take a pill. You take a pill and you're immune to hepatitis A. So as I said, the, the, the way that most people catch hepatitis A is from food preparation people not washing their hands after going to the restroom. Uh, they don't, they get uh, somebody, a chef or a sandwich maker has feces under their fingernails that they didn't get out when they, they didn't do a very good job washing their hands. And they are, they are carrying, they, the food handler himself is carrying a subclinical case of hepatitis A, he doesn't realize he's sick, but he can give that disease to somebody else. So really, to be safe, food preparation people should wear nitrile gloves, which, which so you, you go to the washroom, you wash your hands, and then you put on a pair of nitrile gloves before you start preparing food again. Now you notice in the on the ground floor of Columbia College, we have a subway. The people who are making the sandwiches are wearing plastic gloves. They're wearing uh, plastic gloves, which are better than nothing, uh, but they're not perfect because those type of gloves leak around the seams. Whereas the nitrile gloves that you see here are, are cast in a single piece, so they don't leak. Right? So it's much better to wear those than the plastic gloves, but the plastic gloves are better than bare hands, basically. Right? Um, generally, there's been some resistance in the restaurant industry to get the food preparation people to wear those kind of gloves because people who see them wearing those gloves think that they must be sick and that's why they're wearing the gloves. They look at the gloves and they say, what do you, does your chef have eczema? Does the person who's preparing the sandwiches have some kind of a terrible skin disease? I'm, I'm not going to eat here. I'll go somewhere else. Uh, when in fact, we need to get rid of that attitude. Right, the, we need to get rid of the attitude and we need to instill the attitude that it's a good thing for the kitchen staff to be wearing nitrile or, or latex gloves. All right, let's talk about the Flaviviridae family. There are two members of this family. They have a plus strand, single strand RNA genome. They, are, they have an icosahedral capsid that is enveloped and they replicate in the cytoplasm. There are two example viruses that are in this group, the Flaviviridae. One is the yellow fever virus, which you catch when you're out in the woods. 
it has it is carried by actually it's it's endemic to to central america and south america like brazil the amazon basin places like that yellow fever it's carried by mosquitoes and it has a very high mortality rate we don't really have to worry about it here in bc it's endemic to the tropical climates and it's carried by mosquitoes and then hepatitis c is fomite transmission. So this is another virus that infects the liver, but they are members of the same family. They just have very different, uh, very different diseases that they cause. All right, starting with the yellow fever virus, it is carried by the Aedes aegyptis aegypti mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So it, it's, a, it's yet another mosquito-borne vector. Uh, the uh, the mosquito, I believe, is the definitive host, but actually, pardon me, uh, it, uh, it doesn't have a definitive host because it's a virus. So the, the, the only time we worry about a definitive versus a secondary host or an intermediate host is when you're talking about protists that have an asexual and, and a sexual form. So the, when we talked earlier in the course about Lyme disease, which is caused by a bacteria, there's no such thing as a primary host because, or a definitive host because it only lives in one form. Whereas malaria, Plasmodium vivax, the, par the parasitic protist has many different forms that it can live in, and only the mosquito is the, is the definitive host. Okay, so the Aedes mosquito is a vector for this, right? And it doesn't actually, doesn't actually matter uh, who's, there is no such thing as a, prime, uh, a primary uh, definitive host versus an intermediate host. Okay, so there is yet another disease that's carried by a mosquito vector. The mosquito is a biological vector because it's infected by the virus itself. And it has a monkey reservoir. So technically this is also a zoonotic infection. Now it causes a, hemor a severe hemorrhagic fever which means that you end up vomiting blood. You end up with black, you throw up black vomit. The vomit is black because it's filled with decomposing blood cells. It causes destruction of the blood cells and destruction of liver cells, and it is usually 50% fatal. So if you get yellow fever, the odds of your surviving it are only one in two. So this is a terrible thing, uh, terrible disease carried by a mosquito vector yet again. Okay, hepatitis C, again, it's caused by needle sharing. Uh, we went through a period in the early 80s in Canada where some people caught hepatitis C from blood transfusions because the Canadian Red Cross was not properly screening the blood supply. Uh, that resulted in the Canadian Red Cross disbanding and uh, the, the, the Canadian Red Cross was replaced by what's now known as the Canadian Blood Services. Uh, so if you go to UBC, for instance, to donate blood, there's a, if you go to the UBC village, there's a clinic at the top of, on top of one of the buildings in the village where you can go to donate blood every year. Uh, it's, and it's called the Canadian Blood Services, the CBS. And the reason it's that is because we used to have the Red Cross who collected blood from volunteers, but the Red Cross got disbanded when it got caught in this scandal of people getting hepatitis C and then AIDS because the Canadian Red Cross was not properly screening the blood. That's something that happened in the early 80s, and so the Red Cross was disbanded in Canada as a result of that. It still exists as a, as a charitable organization, but they just don't collect blood anymore. Okay, so this the reason why the hepatitis C is particularly bad is because it turns chronic 75% of the time. So we already learned that hepatitis A, which belongs to a different hepatitis, which belongs to a different viral family, hepatitis A is usually not that bad. Hepatitis B can be bad, but hepatitis C is the worst because if you get exposed to it 75% of the time you get infected and then you may get fulminant hep hepatic failure or FHF, so you should memorize that word. Fulminant hepatic failure is caused by hepatitis C, so you get complete cirrhosis of the liver. Usually it's deadly and there is no vaccine against it. Uh, I've heard that there's a vaccine that's under development which will be ready soon, but at the moment I believe at the moment there's still no vaccine against hepatitis C.
All right, let's talk about the Rhabdoviridae family. The example that we'll talk about is the rabies virus, which is technically known as the Lyssa virus. So I often, often on final exams, I say, what's the technical name for the rabies virus? And you would answer the Lyssa virus. Okay, so rabies is where rabies, one of the things that, one of the characteristics of rabies is that you get encephalitis. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of the symptoms of, of encephalitis is that you kind of go mad. You go, you become delusion. You become a raving lunatic, basically, as a result of this, as a result of the brain encephalitis, which is sometimes fatal. Okay, so this rabies, the Lyssa virus, has a broad host range. It can infect many different types of animals, including humans and including dogs. And that's where the t that's where the expression a rabid dog came from. So occasionally you would see a dog running around the street salivating, and and it it would if it bit you it would transmit it would give you rabies through the saliva because the virus replicates in the salivary glands. Um, it's a neurotrophic virus. It in fact it travels through the nerves into the spinal cord and then upwards to the brain and and then. Uh, it establishes residency in the saliva, salivary glands, and that's why if you get bitten by a rabid animal, the saliva is what's carrying the virus. It, there is a vaccine against it. Very few people get the vaccine unless they're in danger of coming in contact with rabid animals. So it's the, the, the rabies vaccine is not given as a matter of course. Right. Uh, so rabies, just the technical points, it has a negative stranded RNA genome. It has a complex capsid, which is bullet shaped. They call it a bullet shaped capsid. And the capsid is surrounded by an envelope that's derived from the host cell. It replicates in the cytoplasm. Right. So it is a it is classified as a zoonotic infection if you catch it from an animal. Theoretically, you could be bitten by another human being that has rabies and the, you could get it that way. Uh, so it does have an animal reservoir. And so there is a there now there is both an active and a passive vaccine available. So one of the reasons why they don't normally vaccinate people who against rabies who are not planning to work with animals, wild animals in particular. One of the reasons why they don't generally vaccinate everybody against rabies is because it's not that common. And if you are bitten by a rabid animal, they can give you a passive vaccine. So the passive vaccine is you go in and they have a, a bunch of syringes that are filled with antibodies that have been generated by a horse. And so they inject you with these antibodies to prevent the rabies virus that's in your bloodstream. That's uh, Sorry, not in your bloodstream. It's in your nerves. You get injected with these antibodies that have been generated by a horse so that the rabies virus doesn't have a chance to invade your cells. So, that's, so there is a passive vaccine available against rabies. It's one of the most common uses of a passive vaccine is against rabies. So generally what happens is you get bitten by a rabid animal and then the, the rabies virus gets into the nerves and then it travels up the peripheral nerves into your spine and then it travels up your spine and causes encephalitis in the brain, often fatal encephalitis. It establishes a residency in your salivary glands and so then you're shedding the virus in the saliva. Okay, so this is a rabid dog. Right, it, it's clearly insane, basically, and the same thing happens to any other animal. So generally, dogs don't attack you unless the dog's basically the dog's brain is on fire. The day the dog's entire brain is um, uh, uh, inflamed, and that makes you go insane and increases your level of aggression and so on. Okay, so you can also get rabies from raccoons, and we have lots of those in Vancouver, and you can get it from bats, and we have lots of those in Vancouver, except that they don't come out except at night. So at night, when you're out walking, you hear these things flying around that sound like birds. They're squeak, making this squeaking noise. Those are bats. And generally, the bats are good for us because they're out at night eating the insects. They're eating, they're eating the mosquitoes and things, which cause problems. But some of them are occasionally you do have bats that are rabid uh, and so bats generally avoid humans they'll run away from you unless they have rabies in which case they might attack you so if you start getting attacked by a bat it's a good idea to get out of the way to get out of there because that bat may carry rabies 
uh, if you see a raccoon, raccoons, um, if you're not familiar with Vancouver and you're not familiar with raccoons, raccoons look cute. Uh, people are tempted to go and pet them or feed them. In fact, raccoons are very vicious animals, so stay away from raccoons. Uh, you can get you can you can get bitten, but they have very sharp teeth and they're they are very aggressive. And raccoons are, are relatively fearless to begin with, uh, so they're not really afraid of humans. If you go out and you try to you shake it, you hit them with a broom or something to get them away from your house, they may not leave. They may end up fighting back. Uh, so raccoons are generally quite fearless, but they're usually kind of slow and lethargic, and they're not ter they're not terribly aggressive unless you bother them. So if you if you come up to them and try and pet them and tickle them on the head like you would a dog, you might lose your fingers because they will bite. Uh, so you should stay away from raccoons generally. But another good reason to stay away from raccoons is that they do carry rabies. Uh, rabbits can carry rabies. Rabbits are generally scared of humans, but if you see a rabbit trying to attack you, it's probably because it has rabies. Surprisingly, rats do not carry rabies. They carry the bubonic plague and they carry a lot of other things, but luckily they don't carry rabies. So that's one thing that we don't have to worry about rats having rabies. Okay, so as I said, there is a passive vaccine available for rabies. There are passive vaccines available for all kinds of things. So you take the rabies virus and you inject it into a horse. The horse makes the horse's blood makes lots of antibodies that you can then use to create a passive vaccine. Or you can take a person who's had a disease and survived it and you can take their antibodies and inject them into another person, which is actually what pe what people are starting to do now with the coronavirus. A lot of people are getting passive vac passively vaccinated against the coronavirus. What they do is you get a hold of antibodies from somebody who's already had coronavirus and survived it, and their blood serum is filled with antibodies that killed the virus, and then you can inject those antibodies into somebody else and cure them. Okay, the orthomyxoviridae family, these are minus, sing these are minus single stranded RNA genomes with a segmented genome. Right, so they have they have a helical capsid and an envelope with a surrounded by an envelope. They replicate in the nucleus. Right, so the RNA goes to the nucleus. It is not reverse transcript. Uh, tra it's not reverse transcript uh, transcripted, by the way. <clears throat> okay, so the influenza virus is spread. Influenza influenza A and B are members of the Orthomyxoviridae family. They're spread through droplet transmission. They have a segmented genome that, that is composed of eight different chromosomes, and therefore you can have antigenic shift where the chromosomes are reassorted if somebody is co-infected. They have, um, it's a lytic virus, so it, and, and so it destroys the cells that it infects sometimes, and it likes to infect ciliated epithelial cells, which are found in the respiratory tract. So you find ciliated epithelial cells in the bronchial tubes and also in the trachea. Trachea is commonly known as the windpipe. And the influenza virus likes to infect those tissues. Right? And so they get in there and they cause inflammation of the lungs. And sometimes if the lungs are inflamed enough, you'll get a, a bacterial infection secondary to the, to the viral infection. Again, the Orthomyxoviridae family, the, the influenza virus has a broad host range. They can infect humans and birds. The fact that they can infect chickens as well is handy because then we can make our vaccines, yearly vaccines against the seasonal flu. We can produce those viruses to make the vaccine inside chicken eggs. Uh, a whole lot of other animals, pigs, so that's why it's sometimes some variations of it are called the swine flu. Some variations of it are called the bird flu, and this is why. So remember that there are 18 different alleles of the hemagglutinin gene, which is one of the, one of the antigens on the surface of this virus. And there are 11 different alleles, at least as far as we know, there are 11 different alleles of the neuramidase gene, which is another one of the codes for another one of the antigens on the surface. These two genes are located on two different chromosomes. And so that means that every now and then somebody's going to be co-infected with, uh, 
well, if you look up here at this list, if somebody is co-infected with H7N7 and H3N2, you could get an H7N2 variation, or you could get an N7H3 variation, uh, because the chromosomes have been reassorted when they make new viruses. So how many combinations of this are possible? Well, if you have 18 of the N and 11 of, uh, sorry, 18 of the H and 11 of the N, there are a number of different combinations that are possible, but we only, we've only caught a few so far. Uh, there are some people who are working on what's known as a universal influenza vaccine. This is where they're saying, okay, why don't we just take, why don't we just clone all of the genes for the H genes alleles and all of the N gene alleles, make proteins, make a recombinant vaccine, and just inject all the people in the world with all 18 of the H proteins and all 11 of the N proteins, and then we'll be immune to all the influenza viruses at once. And so there are people who are working on that universal influenza vaccine. They have not yet succeeded in creating it, but that's what they're working on. Okay, finally, the retroviridae family. We're going to learn one important member of it, which is the human immunodeficiency virus. The, the, retro, the, the HIV virus has two plus strand RNA. It, it's a, basically a diploid virus that has two copies of, this, of the single chromosome, which happens to be a plus strand RNA. It has a complex icosahedral capsid. It's a slightly different capsid, and it is enveloped. It replicates in the nucleus and it inserts itself into the genome. So it does create a provirus. It does create it does exist as a provirus. Okay, so it, it encodes a reverse transcriptase. So it comes into the cell. Because it has a plus strand genome, it loads directly onto a ribosome. The ribosome starts making capsid proteins and it starts making the reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase enzyme makes a DNA copy of the RNA template. That DNA copy then migrates to the nucleus and inserts itself at some random spot inside the nucleus. Then the RNA polymerase that, that is already in the nucleus, the human RNA polymerase, will start making copies of the DNA copy of the AIDS virus. And that's where we get more genomes to fill the capsids. Now, it happens that, it just so happens that this virus has an affinity for T helper cells, which are a critical part of the immune system. And it attaches itself to a receptor on the surface of T helper cells called the CD4 receptor. So you should memorize that the AIDS virus infects T helper cells and attaches itself to the CD4 receptor. That's an important fact. Okay, so it is generally transmitted sexually, but it's occasionally, it has been transmitted through blood transfusion. I already mentioned that that's why the Canadian Red Cross was disbanded in the 80s, because people ended up getting AIDS from blood transfusions, uh, meaning that they were not screening the blood, they weren't testing the blood properly to see if it was contaminated by hepatitis B or AIDS. It can be spread through dirty needles, which is why we, we have safe injection sites to try and prevent drug addicts, IV drug users from, uh, from using them, uh, from transmitting it to each other by sharing needles. Uh, it, it destroys or incapacitates T helper cells and uh, it ends up, the T helper cells basically coordinate the immune system the humoral immune system. And so if the immune system is uncoordinated, it means that you, uh, you know, it's like you have an army with a general. If you kill the general, all the soldiers don't know what to do anymore. And so their attack on foreign invaders is uncoordinated and sloppy. And so people who have the AIDS syndrome, people who have the HIV, uh, the AIDS syndrome die, generally end up dying from from uh, exotic rare forms of cancer that your immune system would normally kill, that your immune system would normally prevent you from developing. So this is basically just the life cycle of a retrovirus like the HIV virus. You get into the cell, you've got an RNA genome. The viral genome is converted into DNA. The DNA then goes from the cytoplasm and it integrates itself into the host chromosome, one of the host chromosomes at a random spot. And then the host cell RNA polymerase starts making RNA copies from the DNA provirus, which is then put into capsids and then makes more viruses, which continues. 
because AIDS was originally a sexually transmitted disease, we ran into the same type of morality issues in the 80s. And I would say that probably several thousand people died of AIDS who didn't need to because it could be easily prevented by using a condom. It could be slowed down and contained by using a condom. It's not a contagious disease. Uh, in the early 80s, most of you were not here when that happened, but in the early 80s, people didn't began by not realizing that it was caused by a virus. And they had people who were saying um, everyone who has AIDS should be put into a, co a colony like leper colony or something so they won't infect other people. And then other people said, wait a minute, that's, that's a little bit extreme because it's not a contagious disease. It's a communicable disease which is not contagious. So in order to get AIDS, you have to ha have had sex. In fact, you had to have had a lot of sexual contact with somebody that has AIDS. And so that's not like you can catch it on the bus, riding the bus and having somebody sneeze on you the way you can influenza or COVID-19. And uh, there were people who said, well, in the 80s, who said, well, first of all, the, interestingly, in North America and Europe, the first AIDS patients happened to be gay men. So they were homosexual men, and there were a whole lot of people who were homophobic, who said, who had no sympathy for those men and said, well, I don't let them die. We don't care, um, which I think is a horrible attitude. And then, thank goodness, we've moved on from that attitude. And there were other people who said, well... Uh, again, let's not tell anyone how to prevent this because then that'll make everyone promiscuous. And so if we don't tell, if we don't tell the gay men how to prevent this disease by using a condom, then maybe they'll stop having sex with each other. And we don't like the fact that they have sex with each other anyway. And so, uh, so that therefore let's not teach them about using condoms to prevent the spread of this disease. And I think that in fact, the fact that um, the AIDS, the, the AIDS virus went through the, the North American and the European gay men community quite quickly and killed thousands of people for no reason because they weren't they didn't know how to prevent it when they could have easily been told how to prevent it. Uh, but in fact, we kind of, the, the heterosexual community kind of owes a debt of gratitude to the gay community because the the spread of AIDS from the gay community to the heterosexual community was very slow because the there was AIDS in the gay community, and then you had the heterosexual community who who was not, you know, the, the, the two are not related sexually, except by bisexual men. And so there are not there there are not a lot of bisexual men around, but the AIDS slowly moved from the gay community to the heterosexual community through the bisexual men. And by the time it got to the heterosexual community, we had gotten rid of all of these attitudes about don't tell anyone how to prevent it. And by the time HIV actually made it into the heterosexual community, everybody was using condoms and preventing it, preventing the spread of AIDS that way. So in a way, um, we owe a debt of gratitude to the to the gay community because they 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 took one for the team as, as the expression goes, because they, they were hit very hard by this disease in the early 1980s and nobody was willing to help them, which is a terrible comment on human nature. But uh, thank goodness we've outgrown those kind of attitudes now, I hope. Uh, so now we realize that this is just a sexually transmitted disease that can be prevented by preventing the spread of bodily fluids, by preventing the exchange of bodily fluids. And there is no, vaccine against HIV probably because uh, probably because um, uh, because we don't have a B cell that can make antibodies that will attach itself to any of the epitopes, any of the antigens on the surface of the HIV virus. There are some treatments that are used to treat uh, people once they have HIV. And one of them is called AZT, which is a chemical that prevents the, the, the virus capsids from forming properly. And so that means that once the, once the AIDS virus, the HIV virus gets inside a B cell, if the person who's infected is taking AZT, uh, the virus capsid has trouble forming properly. And so the virus has difficulty spreading. And so that might actually slow down the spread of the virus. There's another drug called interferon. Interferon uh, is a drug that uh, potentiates 
it, it, it potentiates and increases the potency of, of natural killer cells that kill uh, other cells that are infected by viruses. Now, in this case, interferon, I believe interferon didn't do a good job of controlling AIDS because you don't want to kill the T helper cells. You have very few T helper cells in our, in our immune system. We have very few T helper cells, but they're critical. So getting rid of the T helper cells just because they're infected with HIV is not the answer because that, that's basically what the AIDS virus does anyway, is it gets rid of or kills the, the uh, infected T helper cells. So AZT works with some, some success at preventing the spread of HIV. I believe interferon didn't work particularly well for that reason. Okay, so remember that you have a couple of tables that you can start studying. The two tables organize the viruses number one according to the types of viruses, and then there's another sheet that gives you the viruses organized according to their viral tropism, according to which organ system they infect instead of what type of genome they have. And so one of the tables looks like this, and the other table looks like this. And there's some exercises at the end of this slideshow that you can go through that have some practice questions. And so I'd encourage you to do that. And uh, the next, so there's a few questions here. I'll let, you go through, I'll let you go through these in your own time. And then our next lecture, I believe, is on uh, Microbiolo uh, microbiology experimental methods in the lab, and also how to control, uh, you know, uh, characteristics of bacterial and microbial growth and development. So I'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you very much.